Hi, I'm Preston Williams, and welcome to another edition of Jazz Talk. Today on our show, we are joined by a jazz legend. That's right, a legend. This gentleman has been on the scene for over 60 years and has worked with many greats from James Brown to Marvin Gaye, Stevie Wonder, Reggie Workman, Lee Morgan, Kenny Clark, and Max Roach, to name a few. He is a saxophonist, composer, and arranger. Please welcome to Jazz Talk the legendary Mr. Odin Pope. How are you, sir? It's a pleasure, Mr. Williams. How are you today? Good, good, sir. Thanks so much. Hey, uh, Odin, I wanted to jump right into this, man, and uh, wanted to start off talking about your humble beginnings and your background. Now, I understand that you're from a place I've never heard before called 96 South Carolina. Educate yes. me, man. I've never of heard of that course. place before. Of course. That's on the map as well. 96. Is, when I when my parents uh, moved to Philadelphia, I was around 10. Yeah. But it, it's still on the map. It's just a great, it's a great little city. Yeah, yeah. So uh, they, uh, okay. So uh, I guess your parents early on, you come from, I guess, a musical family. So didn't they start you out really early as far as like the Baptist church and you sort of had like your roots starting there? Yes, my roots basically is in the Baptist church. My mother was a school teacher mm -hmm. and she also was the conductor of a mass choir, big yeah. mass. My yeah. father was a great baseball player. He was old before his time. Oh, wow. But yes, and they really supported me tremendously into living my dream in terms of finding my roots, what I would like to do, what I would like to proceed, mm. what I'd like to make my career. It was very supportive. That's beautiful. Now, let me ask you, Odin, why did you choose saxophone of all instruments? What made you go with the saxophone? Well, you know, in the beginning, as I said earlier, my mother, she was the Baptist conductor of a really mass choir. And mm -hmm. when we moved to Philadelphia, I was trying to find, find that sound that reminisced in my head of the bad, big mass choir. Yeah. So I started with the piano. I started with the flute. I started with the clarinet. Mm -hmm. So finally, when I picked the saxophone up, I said, this is my voice. This is what I want to do. Yeah. Beautiful, beautiful. So I'm thinking about Philadelphia. My goodness, man, everybody you can think of comes out of there. First person that comes to mind are the Heath brothers. I think of Lee Morgan. I think of McCoy Tyner. I think of Benny Golson. I mean, so Kenny Barron, I can go on and on and on. So you're surrounded with so many great musicians. Now, early on, didn't you start off going to the Graniff School of Music when you were yes, relatively? Yes, I went to the Graniff School of Music. And when I worked with Max, uh, I went to the University of Paris, studied with uh, Kenny Clark. That's right, Kluke. Uh, That's right. Bebop, bebop concepts and rhythmic concepts. And he was a very, very good teacher. I learned so much from him. Yeah. I remember many times when we would perform at the University of Paris, he would always tell Max, Max, you've given them too much. You know, just give them 45 minutes. That's good enough. Max is the kind of person when he started playing, he would just continue to play and play and play until somebody would stop. Yeah. So yeah. I, studying with him was like going to one of the highest universities, which it was in the oh. world. And, and I'm very grateful that I had that opportunity. Yeah. Now, early on, uh, Odin, you uh, worked with uh, two people who were very important to you, uh, Jimmy Merritt and also uh, Ray Bryant. Uh, tell me about those guys. You studied piano what, with Ray Bryant or was it theory? Or what did you study with him? I studied harmony and theory with him. He was a great, great teacher as well as friend. Yeah. And uh, I studied with him a couple of years, uh, harmony and theory and concepts, improvisation concepts. Yeah, yeah. And tell me about uh, your friend, John Coltrane. How did you guys meet? Did you meet him as like a teenager or when you were very, very young? I met him when I was very young through Hassan and Manali. Oh, yeah. He used to practice with Hassan and Manali a lot. So mm -hmm. one day, I was practicing in my mother's basement, and uh, this gentleman knocked on the door, and I came up from the basement, and it was Hassan and Minali. So he said, look, would you be interested in practicing with me? I said, I would be delighted to practice with you. So the answer to your question, by practicing with Hassan, uh, John Coltrane used to come past and practice as well. So that's how I met this great man. Wow. And we, used to, we used to do duets and also play, play with Hassan, with the trio. And playing with them two guys just really impact 
my really wanting to be an artist because it was so much music and so much knowledge and so much information. I was delighted to, to be in that company and it was very good company. Yeah, I mean, working with John Coulter, and I think I read somewhere where you said he would have you guys like practice like for two or three hours, just working on scales and stuff like that. You know, the dedication it takes to do something like that. Well, that's very true. We used to play the scales uh, maybe for maybe two hours before Ooh. we do anything. Nothing but scales, long tones. And I would, I would say to the young people out there who are really trying to get started with the saxophone, Long tones and scales are the secret to a very good uh, sound on your instrument because mm -hmm. playing slow, it gives you the opportunity to listen. Uh, it's, it, it's easy to play fast, but it's very difficult to play slow. Mm -hmm. So we just play slow tones, slow uh, long tones and, yeah. and scales for about two hours. Wow. That's amazing, man. So and I guess you got the other thing, the other solution to that. Yeah. Then we would play, I want to talk about you for maybe two weeks, just that one tune. Wow. To get the ins and outs and to be able to, you know, all the chord changes and to just get a, you know, get a get a concept, not just play the tune, but just get a concept and to make to create and add something to I want to talk about you. Yeah, yeah. You know, and like I said, being around a lot of those musicians, I guess, you know, like maybe Reggie or Lee Morgan, they're kind of like around your age, McCoy Tyner, but, you know, Benny and, and of course Coltrane, they're at least, what, 10, 12 or more years older than you. Sure, being around those guys, you know, you learn so much. And you, you mentioned something about Benny Golson. Uh, you, I guess you even have some of the original sheet music from being around him when he wrote, I remember Clifford. You actually still have that. I remember that Clifford. As a matter of fact, Benny Golson lived a half a block from me. Really? Uh, I lived on Colorado Street, and there was a street running east and west, mm -hmm. uh, French Street, and he lived on French Street, about a half a block. Wow. And there was a club uh, that he used to play at, and periodically my parents would take me there. Wow. And to also mention that John Coltrane gave me my first major gig. That's with, right. Uh, Jimmy Smith. Right, so he was leaving to go to New York to be he with Miles. He was leaving to go to be with Miles, and he asked me, uh, he said, I would like for you to finish out, you know, my engagement with Jimmy Smith. So I said, you got to be kidding me. So he wow. said, no, don't say that. Say, I'm going to walk you through everything you need to know. I'm going to give you all the, the compositions and this, the, uh, the, the repertoire that he's be doing, he'd be doing, and you'll be fine. So working with him for about two weeks with the repertoire, I was able to, you know, feel my way through. I wasn't really comfortable, but it was a wonderful experience for me. You can say Odin Coltrane hooked you up. Yes, <laughs> you know? yes. Hey, I wanted to ask you also, uh, I guess early part of your career, uh, you did some work uh, at the Uptown. And I mentioned earlier, you played with James Brown, Marvin Gaye, Stevie Wonder. Man, what was that like working with those guys? That was, that was amazing. That was incredible. Every 10 days out of every month, yeah. uh, Sam Reed was the Uptown band leader. And he took me on his wings. And we played 10 days out of every month. And mm -hmm. people like James Brown, Marvin Gaye, like you said, Herbie Stevie Wonder, The Temptations, Gladys Knights, all of the Motown artists came through. And that was like uh, a school itself because it was, I got a chance to talk to Stevie Wonder, the Temptations, James Brown, and all of the great uh, soul people. And it was really, really very interesting. Man, that's incredible. Wow. I, I just I marvel. I'm thinking about these people you worked with. Um, I also wanted to ask you um, about uh, a couple other people, your good friend, Lee Morgan. And, uh, you know, you guys are around the same age. Um, tell me, man, what type of a person, what, what, what was Lee like? You know, did you guys like spend a lot of time together practicing or working on stuff all the time? We used to do duets uh, in my basement as well as his basement. Mm -hmm. And Lee was a very warm, humble pe person. And he was very giving. He would always share what he had with me. And mm -hmm. I would share what I had with him. And it was like a mutual understanding. He was a very beautiful person. And I'm just so grateful and humble that I had that wonderful opportunity to 
to share with him. He was one of the great, great, great forerunners of what we do. Oh, yeah. Great horn player. I know Miles liked him a lot. And of course, you know, he got that big start with Dizzy when he was young, I guess, in his mid-teens. Um, and uh, I still, to this day, listen to his recording, one of my favorites, Search for the New Land. I just love that yes, one. Yes, 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 yes. Also, and, one of my favorite ones is, is uh, Moments Notice with, Je with John Coltrane. Oh, so love that, you know, man. He, just, he, just, he was just so incredible, extraordinary. Yeah. His solo and his lines. Yeah, you know, I play that all the time. You know. Yeah, it's beautiful. Did you he catch that? Very, time? very inspiring. Very, very inspiring person. Oh, he was man, and you know we lost him at such a young age. Did you catch that documentary? I called him Morgan. What do you think of that? I liked it. I thought it was good. I thought yeah. uh, the people who put it together, they spent a lot of time putting it together. I thought it was really nice. Yeah. I would just like that. I wish I could have got a chance to hear just a little bit more of him. Yeah. And some of the great things that he really, really put together and some of the things that he shared with people. I yeah. wish I had got a chance to hear a little bit more of that. Yeah. I was going to ask you um, also, you know, with some of the people that you work with, how did you get to uh, end up working with Max Roach? And as I mentioned to you, and I guess you and I chatted a little bit on the phone, I guess uh, the day yesterday, uh, I told you that group that you guys were with, with you, Max, Cecil Bridgewater, and Calvin Hill, man, that group smoked. And I love how Max would always do his little little tribute thing to uh, Papa Joe Jones and Sid Catlett, that ba da da ba ba da da ba ba da da ba ba da da I right. love that. And I still, I still yes, remember yes. it, you know, but uh, tell me, how'd you get to work with Max, man? And what was that experience like for you? Because like you said, he's uh, one of the giants too, along with Kenny Clark. Well, you know, uh, like you mentioned his name early, Jimmy, Jimmy Murray. Uh, I got the opportunity to be in that group called the Forerunners. Yeah. He had a group called the Forerunners and consist of uh, quintet trumpet. Uh, tennis, saxophone, piano, bass, and drums. Mm -hmm. And practicing with him, we used to practice two or three times a week. Mm -hmm. And he was, he was, he had the job to go to work with Max Roach. He was called to go with Max Roach. And at that time, Billy Hopper, I think, was, 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 was leaving. And so Jimmy asked Max, there's the horn player in Philadelphia, I'd like for you to audition maybe he could make, make this tour with us. So for two weeks, Jimmy Murray and I went to New York and Max was the kind of person he didn't like at that time, his quartet, he didn't like no music on the bandstand. So he said, we got 10 tunes to learn in two weeks. And I want you to memorize every 10 tunes. I don't want no music on the bandstand. Mm. So what his principles were, he would play four measures of music and then turn the music, o turn the music over. And we would play that. Yeah. And he would play another four measures for about maybe five minutes. Then he would turn the music over. To make a long story short, that's how he memorized 10 compositions in two weeks. That's how we memorized 10 compositions in two weeks by mm -hmm. using that process. Yeah. Did you get a chance to work with Max when he and Abby? We're doing that freedom, uh, that piece that they would do back, I guess it was 64, 65. Did you work with them a little bit then or not a little bit until later after that? I worked with uh, with Max and Abby uh, later on, yes. Okay. And uh, Abby was really a, a giant, extraordinary singer and yes, sure. very great person to, to know. So working with Max and Abby was, again, like going to the highest university in the, in the world. So I learned so much. I'm just being around them. Yeah, yeah. Tell me about this uh, this group that you formed called Catalyst, man. You know, uh, tell me about that. What was the basis of that, and what were you trying to say or do with that? Well, we was we we was working at a school called Mall Cities. Mm -hmm. uh, I first got the job as the director, the uh, the band director. So the group that I had been working with, I got all of them jobs there. So we was working from, we were working four days a week from four to eight. And after eight o'clock, we would stay there and practice and practice and practice. So that's how that group came together by coming to the Model Cities Cultural Arts Program. Mm -hmm. We used to practice maybe, every, we worked four nights a week. 
and we used to practice every night. So that's how that group uh, with Eddie, Eddie Green, Sherman Ferguson, Slim, and also Tyrone Brown came together. Yeah, yeah, that was that was, that was some good stuff that you guys were doing, man. And uh, you also work with uh, bassists, as I mentioned earlier, Reggie Workman. I think you guys used to hang, you and uh, Lee Morgan. Did you say something? I think I read somewhere you said that uh, back during that time, um, Reggie was like the only one that had a car and he would pick yeah, musicians Reggie, up and stuff Reggie, like that. Yeah, Reggie had a hearse. His father bought him a hearse Ooh, to carry his bass in. Yeah. So Reggie would, every Monday night, uh, and two or, three, two or three times a week, we would come together. We had sessions where we would go. There was one great session in particular over in Camden, New Jersey. They would pay for the trio to perform, and then they would have a special table for all the musicians who would come over and sit in and just be a part of that. So mm -hmm. that was like that was like the, the the hunting grounds for getting all our jobs together and getting all our information in terms of chord changes, improvisation studies, and chord changes. Yeah. It was like really going to another school. Going to another school, yeah. You've also, uh, Mr. Pope, worked with a lot of young musicians too. I guess back in the day, you worked with a uh, Christian McBride and Joey DeFrancesca. And I remember you told the story, man, you gave them, I think, what, some type of cold train piece and they just took the song, man, and just went with it, did some some fresh new stuff with them. I think it surprised you, you know, just the talent of these young guys. What was it like working with them, man? Well, you know, I had received this grant to do a, a residence for 10, 10 weeks mm -hmm. at the, uh, the uh, at their school. And when I went to the school, uh, I met them, they were 16, and there were some other people, but in particular, every week I would work there Monday, Tuesdays, and Wednesdays. I mean, I'm sorry, Friday. Mm -hmm. And every Monday when I would go there, they would be the first ones in, in, in the band room. So one day I got there a little earlier, and I started, I was playing giant steps, playing, you know, playing the giant step changes and all that. Mm -hmm. So they ran in the room and they said, what is that? So I said, this is Giant Steps, John Coltrane's Giant Steps. So they said, well, could you write the changes out for me? That was a Monday. I wrote the changes out for them. And Wednesday, when I came back, they was in the, in the band room. I was amazed. They was playing like they had wrote the composition themselves. And they was adding so many different concepts. Joey DeFrance, let's go and Krista McBride. I, mm -hmm. I couldn't believe it. I just, I was like really amazed what they was doing with me. Yeah, that is incredible, man. Wow. Um, you know, also I was going to ask you, did you ever get a chance to, well, like I said, I know you and John Coltrane were friends. Were you, uh, what, what were you, what was your perception of him? I guess right around the time, I guess he was doing like a love Supreme. Then he started going more, you know, avant-garde into the mix, mid sixties when he was with Rashid Ali and those guys. And I think he had two drummers as well. Alvin uh, was still there. Did you like what he was doing or, did you like, mm, this may not be the type of direction that I that I like her. Were you with Coltrane pretty much the whole time? Just like, yeah, I like what he's doing. This is this is uh this is something really, really good. You know, were you like following him into that direction he was going? You know, what impressed me most was his musical genius as well as his commitment yeah. to speaking to the social as well as political issues of his time. And I thought. That was a great time for him to move into another direction. I love yeah. it. Yeah. You know, I think uh, so many people like Reza Workman, Rossi Ali, and uh, McCoy Tyner, as well as the other musicians, I think they loved what he was doing as well because yeah. he was opening up new doors and new avenues and just new concepts for yeah. the upcoming musicians. And he inspired so many people. You know, you think about John Gilmore. Archie Shep, Albert Eiler, all of them were affected, you know, by by uh, by him and the work that he did. I wanted to ask you, when you're at home, just relaxing and just kicking back, what is Odin Pope listening to? What are you checking out? A little bit of some old stuff or new stuff? What do you listen to when you're at home, Mr. Pope? Well, you know, at this time, I'm really doing a lot of practice and research mm -hmm. on the keyboards and the computer. Yeah. So this basically is my day job. Yeah. Uh, my piano, my saxophone, and the computer writing music. Yeah. Uh, 
I, I occasionally I get a chance to listen to uh, train and you know some of the upcoming people at uh, Emmanuel Wilkins, mm -hmm. who is I don't know he's one of the upcoming great great young talents, and sometimes I you know get a chance to listen to him and train and a few other people, but most of my time is geared towards my saxophone, uh, the piano, and the computer. Yeah, yeah. Now, you being the great composer and arranger that you are, have you ever done any film scores before? Or is that something you'd like to get into, you know, do more of? Yes, I would definitely like to get into that. This is this is something that I've been working on. I've been working on some films with some young people in Philadelphia. So yeah. there's a young lady, Nadine. She, uh, she's uh, like a poet and a, and a songwriter also. So I've been doing some things with her, some films with her. Oh, that's great, man. That's great. And uh, um, is that something that uh, we'll all be able to listen to and hear anytime soon? Or well, this 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 we did this some years ago, and okay. uh, my my current things that I'm working on now is with a lot of young people, and I had just received the grant. Beautiful to man. write new music, to write a suite of new music. Mm -hmm. And Emmanuel Wilkins and myself, we are both working on new suites and we have, it runs from January to June. And, and that ensemble called every sound name. Yeah. And we, was, we received the grant from uh, South Arts to do this. And the good thing about it is it's a project that we can do what we want to do. And what we are doing, we are like trying to enhance the great legacy that Philadelphia has. As we all know, there are some of the greatest minds that this country has produced that, that's, that was produced right here in Philadelphia and it still is, still is great minds that's still here. So this particular grant gives us, gives, us, gives us the opportunity to just explore, you know, different concepts like Train was doing. Mm -hmm. Explore different things, different scales, different concepts, different improvisation concepts. As a matter of fact, we have a, a resident coming up in April. Yeah. That, where we have, uh, it's a core ensemble that consists of 14 people. And then there's a diverse ensemble that consists of 20 people that we are going to let them explore our music, get their concepts and ideas, and just have, celebrate, just celebrate this great art form that we have here in America. Amen to that, man. That's beautiful. Now, in this last segment, I want to do a play a little game with you. I'm going to name some musicians, uh, all of them you know, and I want you just to say the first thing that comes to your mind. There's no right or wrong answer, whatever you uh, you think. First name, Coleman Hawkins. Coleman Hawkins was one of my great, great lovers from when he, he did that 1939 Body and Soul. I love that. I had to sheet music to that. Mm. I love it. And I still have a sheet music. He's one of my first, first people that really that I listened to and had that I thought that had a had a had a had a meaning, had a had a like prayers used to say, what's your story? He had a story. I really love Coburn Hawkins and I still listen to him and think he's still one of the great, great forerunners of what we do. Yeah. Next name, Ben Webster. Again, it's the same thing. It's the same kind of feeling. Ben Webster, I'm so, I'm so glad that I had the opportunity to meet him. And we was playing in Ronnie Scott's in Europe. And Ben Webster, he was like sort of on his way out. He, was, he had sort of semi-retired, but he used to come into the club every night. And he had the kind of voice that you could hear over, over the club would be packed and you could hear his voice over everybody else's voice. And he gave me some great, great, uh, comments and some great things to do. And I still think that him and Coleman Hawkins, they had a very big story to tell. Yeah, yeah. And they Next told it. That prayers used to always say, what is your story? But they had a story. Amen, that's wonderful. Next name, Charlie Parker. Charlie Parker, man, man. <laughs> you know, when I first heard him, I couldn't believe what, what was happening. Yeah. I mean, I mean he was... He was so lyrical and so, I mean, it's, there are not too many words that can really 
say that the person uh, to add to what he added to the music scene. But the most important thing that I liked about him, he changed the whole scene. He changed everything. He did. I mean, everybody was amazed, extraordinary. He is this extraordinary man. Where did he come from? Where, how, what, what, what is this? What have he been doing? And he's, he was the kind of person that practiced 11 hours a day. Yeah. He used to, he used to want, run his neighbors crazy because he used to practice 10, 12, and 11 hours a day. So the answer to your question is extraordinary. Yeah, your bird was something else. I forgot what musician said when he heard him. He says, I hear you, but I don't believe it. You couldn't believe it. Let me add a little form. story to that. Yeah. You know, uh, when Train, Sonny Stead, and Sonny Rollins, you know, they both played alto. They all played alto, Jimmy Heap. When they heard Bird, this is supposed to be a true story. They all went up to, to Bird's uh, hotel and hollered up to Bird and said, Bird, you got the alto. That's and they all switched to tennis, Sonny Rollins, Sonny Stitt, and uh, John Coltrane. They all, they all switched to, to, to tennis. That's incredible. Next name, we just mentioned him. We didn't talk a whole lot about him, but uh, Prez, Lester Young. You know, Lester Young was one of my favorites uh, because his plan was so lyrical and his sound was so different from all of the other tenor players that I had heard. Mm -hmm. And it was so warm and so, you know, it was so transcend, like it was, it would, it would, it would transcend you into uh, like things that you never experienced before, you know? And when I would listen to him, in fact, I, I hadn't got my horn yet, but I still was listening to some of the music that, that I really loved. And he was one of my favorite tenor players in terms of not only improvisation study, but sound quality, uh, singing. Like he used to always say, you have to sing through your instrument. Mm -hmm. Make your instrument an extension of you. And these are the things that I held hold to my uh, studies right now. Sing through your instrument. Make your instrument be an extension of what you do. That's something. Next name, Sonny Rollins. Nuke. <laughs> <laughs> Sonny Rollins. You know, I I just talked to I talked, talked to Sonny about a year ago. And Sonny, you know, my first experience with Sonny, I was teaching at the school I was telling about back with, with college we was teaching. Mm -hmm. So he was working with Max Roach at the time. So I got a chance to ask him, would he come down to my school? and talk to the musicians. So he was generous enough to come down to the school and talk to the musicians, play, and give them some information. Sonny Rollins was one of my, also one of my favorite, favorite, because he, when he came on the scene, he was like prayers and train. He changed the whole scene. It was Sonny Rollins. Everybody was trying to play like Sonny Rollins. So mm -hmm. then I think when you look at Sonny Rollins, you look at like Bird, and train yeah. Coleman Hawkins and Ben Webster because his generation and his generation, he changed the whole scene. And for somebody to come along and do that, like Bird, Coleman Hawk, and Ben Webster and John Coltrane, it takes a lot of hard work and discipline. And the answer to your question, Sonny Rollins is in that arena that I think is who was gifted with something very special. He was, he was gifted with something that very few people come along with because he, just like Coleman Hawkins, Ben Webster Train, they was also gifted with that, what they call seven cents. You know, when you look at Sonny Rollins, he's still with us. Yes. He's one of the greatest minds that, that ever walked the planet. And mm -hmm. I love him. I, I love him dearly. I just hope the creator bless him and keep him sound and safe. Yeah. Well, we've talked about uh, the greatness of John Coltrane. Next name, Joe Henderson. You know, Joe Henderson, again, I got a chance to meet him. And again, his generation, when he came, when he came along, he, he, his sound was much different from 
from much different from Coleman Hawkins and Sonny Rollins and John Coltrane. So I think he was greatly influenced by, by Coleman Hawkins and uh, Ben Webster as well as Sonny Rollins, but he also had his own sound. You know, we all uh, are inspired by somebody. You know, like John Gilmore said, uh, John, John Coltrane uh, was interviewed one time and uh, the interviewer said, well, you know, say, John, you know, that's, that, 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 that piece that you sound chasing a bird, chasing a train, sound like John Gilmore. He said, well, you know, we are all in this world pooed together. And to get back to Sonny Rollins and John and Joe Henderson, Joe Henderson was one of those great, great players. I mean, he was, I mean, I still listen to him. I mean, he, he was just, there's nothing I can say but greatness about him. He was, if it's, if it's, if it's anything as being the great, great, great player, extraordinary player, then he was that. Yeah, yeah, definitely that. Next name, Wayne Shorter. Wayne Shorter, again, he was very young when he, when he first went with Miles. And I think Miles saw something that was different from all of the other horn players. Mm -hmm. Wayne Shorter, as I said earlier, we all are in this world put together. I think Wayne Shorter, he had something different. His sound, his sound was, was much different from, from Train or Coleman Hawkins or Ben Webster. And I think that's what Ma saw in him, that he was one of these young musicians that comes along maybe every maybe 100 years, like Train and all the, the rest of the greats. I would say he was among the great, great, great innovators because when he played today, his sound and his and his whole real well-being, it was just so extraordinary. So I was really, really impressed with everything he was doing during that time. And I'm so sorry to hear, I think he's, uh, I think he might be still playing. I think he's still with us. Yeah, and an incredible composer, too. I mean, I put him right up there with Ellington and Mingus and those guys. I mean, Wayne oh, no is a doubt, no composer, doubt. you know. Uh, next name, Archie Shep. You know, Archie Shep was from Philadelphia, you know. When he came up from Fort, Fort Dale, Florida, he uh, landed in, in Philadelphia. And him and Lee Morgan and myself, we used to play duets together. Mm -hmm. So by playing with him and, and listening to him, most people don't know that he was like a, he was like a poet or actor, you know. He was like, a, but when he heard train, he picked the saxophone up and he he just he just couldn't turn it loose. He and he had something altogether different. Again, I mean, train influenced him greatly, but mm -hmm. he was strong enough to say, "Well, look, train, uh, I'm going to let you play yours." your style and I'm gonna play my style. And he was like Al Alvin Aller, you know, because he was like in that school, he was like Ann Van Gardish and he still is. I just heard him and uh, Jason Moran, they, they got a, I don't know whether you heard that, mm -hmm. but he just, I mean, they just recorded last year and I heard that. But getting back to Archie Shep, Archie Shep was so dedicated and so, uh, deeply involved in not only music, but so many other things. He was one of my forerunners. He was the one that I looked up to while he was here in Philadelphia. And he was the kind of person that would, he, would, would come up with all kinds of different concepts and all kinds of different ideas, all kinds of different configurations, harmonically, melodically, and rhythmically. Yeah. And to, to hear Archie Shep, during that time, as well as now, is like listening to somebody who have their own sound. And I really admire anybody with all of the influences out here to come up with their own sound. And Archie Shep has his own sound. Yes, he does. Next name, Hank Mobley. Again, Hank Mobley lived in Philadelphia. His last years was in Philadelphia. Yeah. And Hank Mobley gave me uh, one of his compositions, This I Did of You. Uh, 
uh, his last years, he lived out was in Philadelphia. And I got a chance to, I've been very fortunate to meet some of the great, great minds. I just, I feel very blessed. I'm very humble. I just feel very good about, you know, hi, the creator has been to me. The creator has been very good to me. I met so many great, great minds. And again, Hank Mobley was one of those, not only great composers, but a great innovator. He did his own music. And when you can stand out on your own and do your own music, that is saying something. And he was one of those great, great forerunners. Yeah. There's a lot of other great saxophone players, but there's one more that I want to add to the list. I think he's brilliant as a composer, arranger, fantastic uh, player. His name is Odin Pope. And I put you in that class with those guys, man. You're, you're, you're brilliant. And like I said, uh, you're in the mix. With all of those guys, man, you just continued on that that uh, that tradition, and you still do it now. You know, working with other musicians, the youngsters, and uh, Odin Pope is a, is a class act. I'm so thankful to have you on Jazz Talk today. It's been a pleasure just sharing this time and space with you. Hang on, I'm about to close out the show. Well, you've heard it from the great Odin Pope, and as the saying goes, if the music grooves and makes you move, it must be jazz. I'm Preston Williams with Jazz Talk signing off. Peace. <laughs>